friends around the world report inconsistencies in their favorite stories. Are they real, or just a result of having way too much time on your hands? The internet searches for answers on Suck My Fan Theory. The year is 1969. Four friends and their beloved dog pile into a painted panel van and set off to unmask monsters and solve mysteries. The van is affectionately referred to as the Mystery Machine, and it carries the Mystery Incorporated Team, a group of amateur detectives just having graduated from high school. Drifting from town to town, confronting monsters, one may find it odd that a group of kids with bright futures would choose to leave their friends and family and troll the back roads of America, confronting criminals and putting themselves in danger. Perhaps they had a good reason for doing this. Some say that they were eager for adventure and driven to find their purpose in life, all while searching for truth. Others believe they were dodging the draft. Seventies were an easier time. Everyone was all about peace and love. Almost everyone I knew that went to Vietnam died over there. I could definitely see why people would run away. Damn kids said they were helping people. If you ask me, it was just the opposite. I didn't dress up as a mummy to scare people. It was to bring in tours to my town. It helped everyone get by. We would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for those meddling kids. I rented them a hotel once. And I could have sworn I heard the stoner and the homosexual talking about how they weren't cut out for the army. The Vietnam War officially began in 1955, but escalated due to the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964. The United States Selective Service Draft Lottery began December 1st, 1969, under the orders of Richard M. Nixon, in order to help fight the war in Vietnam. It was at this point that many young men across America fled their hometowns, afraid that they would be sent to a war they did not want to fight in. Mystery Inc. comprised of Fred Jones, Daphne Blake, Norval Shaggy Rogers, Velma Dinkley, and their beloved Great Dane, Scooby-Doo. A mystery-solving corporation provided the perfect cover to escape selective service, moving from town to town before any locals could recognize their faces. But if this were their true intentions, why would Mystery Incorporated include Daphne and Velma? Women were not drafted into the military. I went to high school with those guys. Fred and Daphne were inseparable. In fact, they even caught making whoopee at the senior prom. Shaggy and Velma were a different story, though. You could tell Velma was in love with Shaggy, but there was only one girl for him, Mary Jane. This makes sense. Four young, idealistic hippies in love on a road trip to outrun Uncle Sam. Consider their van, the Mystery Machine. It was the vehicle of choice for many free love types, which you could readily see parked on the curb of Haight-Ashbury. It must have been purchased to advertise the detective service and let everyone who saw know their political stance on the war. This included painting the pastel flowers on the side and scrawling in Mystery Machine for the corporation. The paint job portrayed the group as a bunch of peace-loving hippies. This would have been the case if they had been the original owners of the vehicle. A newly unearthed document actually proves that the title was transferred to Fred from Flash Flanagan the long-haired, hammer-and-sickle-loving former folk sensation, famous for his protest anthem, Come On, Think This Through. Come on, think this through, this war ain't cool, we got some work to do now. Come on, think this through, this war ain't cool, we need some help from you now. Come right into view, I see Pretending you got the answers You're not fooling me Cause I can't see The way you laugh and banter 
After his one-hit wonder, the only work he could find was touring with an anti-war band in an old blue, green, and orange van with their name emblazoned on the side. The Mystery Kids. A van made specifically for a group of youths railing against the establishment of Richard M. Nixon. The Mystery Machine made the would-be draft dodgers all too conspicuous. If you were trying to evade the draft, why would you make yourself so blatantly obvious? Unless they weren't draft dodgers, but they wanted people to think they were. Newly obtained documents show doctors provided medical clearance to both Fred and Norville. Fred, suffering from bone spurs, and Norville, suffering from glaucoma, both would have been unfit to serve in the United States military. Why would they need to dodge the draft? Throwing people off the scent, making them think that they were hippies, provided the ultimate cover for their true mission, protecting Scooby-Doo. While claiming to uncover mysteries, they were actually concealing government secrets. Well, you see, I was in my barn one night, saw the craziest thing. Some sort of space doohickey I thought was a Mitchell. Crashed through my weather vane and damn near took my roof off. I tell you what, swear to God, I saw two little brown puppies come running out of some metal contraption. A couple of days later, some men in black suits came and took it all away. Yup, I done told everyone up at the diner, but no one believed me. They said I must have been licking the back of toads to get high again. Well, heck, sometimes I don't even believe me. All I knows is nothing will grow where that dang thing done crashed. Of course, one simple eyewitness is not enough to cast doubt on the canine's origin. That is, until you consider that neither Scooby nor Scrappy-Doo have ever been able to provide legitimate birth records. It's common knowledge that all dogs go to heaven, but where do they come from when they were never born? At the height of the Cold War, the threat of communism replaced the boogeyman as the monster under everyone's bed. Nikita Khrushchev and his horde of sadistic, savage scientists attempted to genetically create a whole number of nightmarish creatures. We have asked a Soviet-era Russian expert to help us examine the claim that Scooby and Scrappy-Doo are the results of these tests. Professor Who T.F. Cares is the chair of DeVry University's Cold War Studies Department. He is an expert on the scientific breakthroughs of this period. Botanist Ilya Ivanovich really led a Soviet scientific community that engaged in many very taboo, very risky cross-species experiments. This included half-gorilla, half-human soldiers, two-headed snakes, and intelligent animals smart enough to think like humans. It is also well known that they used animals for space travel to test the effects orbit had on biology before sending humans. In 1960, they sent two dogs, Bella and Strelka, into space, and they were the first ever Earth-born creatures to fly into space and return alive. Now, where have we seen walking, talking, intelligent dogs before? It is conceivable that two rogue experiments grown in Soviet Russia testing facilities could have escaped captivity and made their way to America. Professor T.F. Cares. Oh, yes, two sentient, talking dogs could have totally flown a spacecraft from Russia and crash-landed on a farm. Only for four teenagers to find them and hide them from the U.S. government by solving mysteries. That's undoubtedly what happened. The first documented accounts of Scooby-Doo began exactly two months after the Apollo 11 lunar landing. Could the Soviets, desperate to keep up in the space race, have sent their two best and brightest on a mission to space? A mission that was doomed to fail. It is believed that Scooby and Scrappy are actually Belka and Strelka, the two beings on the planet with the most spaceflight experience. To avoid a suicide mission to the moon, they stole a spacecraft and piloted it to the only place that wouldn't willingly give up two Soviet assets. When the CIA caught wind of this potential source of intelligence, they turned their eye upon their own people, scouring the land for clues as, as to the whereabouts of the two dogs. This lends a new, sinister meaning to the common refrain, Scooby-Doo. 
Where are you? So there you have it. The classic tale of a creator's attempts to play God backfiring when their creation escapes their control. The rest is history. A group of animal-loving, bleeding-heart, East Coast yuppies on the run held hostage by the dubious will of these renegade agents. With more and more facts coming out against the gang, it seemed that believers would finally see the truth revealed about America's favorite dog detective. However, right when allegations reached a fever pitch, tragedy struck. Breaking news tonight, as we report with heavy hearts, the unexpected passing of Scooby Doo, also known as Scooby Dooby Doo. Although details are still emerging at this time, authorities have confirmed that Scooby was found unresponsive earlier today in his Calabasas home. News of this shocking event has traveled quickly around the world. After this came an outpouring of sympathy for Scooby and the gang, passing away at three years, ten months, and nine days old. 27 in dog years, he became the latest member of the infamous 27 Club, joining close friends Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Jim Morrison. Devotees came out in droves, blinded by sadness and nostalgia, to canonize this far from perfect pup. It became very unpopular to speak unfavorably of him, and so his critics were silenced. But over the decades, those out there seeking the truth have not forgotten. They have not stopped fighting, never stopped searching, and never stopped asking, Scooby Dooby Doo, who are you? In the 1970s, London was a hotbed for revolutionary candy making. Many sweet names and big candy came out of this period, but the hottest tamale of them all was Willy Wonka. No one could even touch Willy Wonka. He set the precedent for eccentric visionaries. In fact, many people have even called Steve Jobs the Willy Wonka of the personal computer. Perhaps best known for his unorthodox secession plan, Wonka is a name that isn't likely to leave the tips of our tongues for some time. The global chocolate magnet built his world-famous brand based on childlike wonderment and an innocent persona. New research into his life and candy empire have revealed shocking developments, proving that this chocolatier was more sour than sweet. They tell a story of intellectual property theft, discriminatory business practices, and even murder. If you were to talk to people who knew him from the beginning, they would tell you the real story of Sir William S. Wonka. Former associates who apprenticed with him under Milton Hershey saw a different side of the lovable, top hat-wearing, sugar-coated visionary. A man capable of climbing the corporate ladder in a cutthroat industry. A man who was willing to take any idea he was able to get his butterfingers on. Charles Catterbury is a man who worked alongside Wonka when they began their journey in the candy-making business. He now owns a small, moderately successful candy shop in suburban London. For years, he was afraid to speak out. Wonka Company is one of his biggest suppliers, their products flying off his shelves. He feared any form of retribution from the multinational conglomerate. But our investigation has provided him the platform to burst Wonka's double bubble. I'll never forget Willy Wonka, or uh, Bill, as we used to call him. Man, I was best friends with that guy, including our friend Slugworth. We were like the three musketeers. That first day when Bill somersaulted through the door, I knew that guy was just different. He comes off as an airhead to the public, but he's not actually like that at all. Bill could talk to a brick wall, never forgot a thing, always bringing up any details you mentioned in conversation. He never really was that good at making candy, but he had a taste for business, always predicting the next big thing or anticipating the market. Had this manic energy about him, you know? He'd be laughing and joking with you, but if you pressed the wrong candy button, he would just turn into an atomic fireball. This mixture of social aptitude and emotional volatility is common in serial killers such as Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Charles Manson, and some say Richard M. Nixon. I remember one time I told him about my idea to put schnozberries in candy. The next day he had a prototype and was telling everyone he came up with it. 
I used to think I was the only one he ever screwed over, but he stole a lot of paydays from some great creators. I get it. You can't climb that high without breaking a few jaws, but I haven't said anything. If you speak out against Wonka, you'll be sleeping with the Swedish fishes in no time, if you know what I mean. Although everyone in the candy industry knew of Wonka's ruthless, caramel-covered tactics, that didn't stop Wonka's rise to fame. It was in the late 1950s that he released the Wonka Bar, a chocolate like no other. It has even been documented that the national rate of cavities increased proportionately to the Wonka Bar's sales growth. It had a sweet taste unfamiliar to many Western audiences, made by the cocoa from special trees only found in the lost continents of Africa. How did Wonka get this proprietary chocolate, and what was he willing to do to keep it to himself? Was Wonka on an inventive tutti roll, or was he merely a common criminal? Documents recently uncovered from an archive in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, prove that Wonka reached new heights of depravity in the pursuit of the best chocolate in the world. Soon after completing his apprenticeship with Milton Hershey, he journeyed to Africa, looking for the sweetest bite to eat. Stopping at nothing to satiate his desires, he found a tribe of African pygmies, tricking them into indentured servitude and taking their special strain of cocoa tree for himself, uprooting all known saplings and planting them in his factory. At first, the Africans believed they were getting the opportunity to move to the modern world and start a better life, but quickly, they found themselves feeling like a bunch of dum-dums. Every day working for Mr. Wonka felt like another day in hell. We uprooted our families and thought we could give our children better lives. We signed contracts. He said that if we worked for him for seven years, he would give us enough money to settle down and buy our own houses. He promised us the moon pie and we believed him. After months of working 18-hour days and only being paid in chocolate and candy cigarettes, I developed a two-pack-a-day habit. We realized we were likely never going to make it past the first few years. Thank God the chocolate river flooded, forcing us to flee the factory into the streets of London or else no one would have even known about what was happening to us. I swear that saved our lives. Many pygmies were also thankful that they weren't in the U.S. because they knew that Richard M. Nixon and his pro-business policies wouldn't have helped them a bit. Scandal rocked the Wonka brand. The public began protesting, insisting that they didn't want any Wonka candies now or later, until things were changed. Reluctantly, Wonka freed the pygmies, but maintained his morbid fascination with little people. He would, until the end of his public days, only hire dwarves. Reports claim he forced them to sing and dance for him while engaging in orange face. After this big controversy, and years of scandals like it, Wonka knew he had to do something to turn the tide of public opinion. The year was 1973. Richard M. Nixon was playing at his war games in Indochina, throwing away the lives of countless young men. Secretariat won the Triple Crown. The Exorcist was haunting moviegoers all across the globe, and the world was still mourning the loss of the universally beloved pop Scooby-Doo. In a global society yearning for bright sunshine and a time of darkness, Willy Wonka announced a contest with the Golden Promise. Amongst the hundreds of thousands of candy bars shipped to consumers are five glistening golden tickets. Whoever is lucky enough to unwrap this sweet surprise is offered free admission to the legendary Wonka factory. Riots break out as the masses clamor for a glimpse behind the secretive walls Wonka has built around himself in the preceding years. After an exhausted search, the winners are Augustus Gloop, Veruca Salt, Violet Beauregard, Mike TV, and after some time, Charlie Bucket. In typical fashion, the winners arrive at the gates to much fanfare, and the enigmatic Willy Wonka emerges from the foreboding oaken doors. This recently uncovered archival interview from the BBC gives the perspective of an attendee that day. He first walked out looking like a slowpoke. He didn't seem to have that typical Wonka razzle. In fact, I wasn't entirely sure that he was alive and well until he cast his candy cane to the side and did a, a whatchamacallit, a somersault. After that, the five kids walked in with him like a bunch of little sweethearts. Five kids may have walked into the factory that day, but only one walked out victorious. Where did the others go? 
It has never been confirmed what happened that day, but regardless, the Suck My Fan Theory team is insistent on revealing what happened with absolute certainty. Many claim to have seen the children that lost leave the factory maimed and physically deformed hours after they entered into Wonka's Wonderland. Others swear that the original children were still in the factory, replaced by crisis actors, and they say they've got the evidence to prove it. Some of these actors have come forward under the guise of anonymity for their safety to tell the truth. Yeah, I was a child actor. In fact, my first gig was in one of Wonka's commercials. He must have taken some sick interest in me because he kept asking me back to act in other things. He took interest in a lot of kids. They'd come over to the factory, spend the night with him, even without their parents. Finally, after he announced the competition, he called up my parents and told them he had a job for me scheduled the day of the tour. I showed up and they painted me blue and then wrapped this large paper mache sphere around me. All I had to do was act upset and waddle to a limo. After that, I never heard from him again. Thank God, he always creeped me out. I'm just lucky I never spent the night with him. All of my friends would tell me about weird things that would go on. I don't care how popular and beloved you are, parents shouldn't leave their kid alone with any adult that likes to be around kids that much. There you have it. Irrefutable testimony from a crisis actor privy to Wonka's red-hot schemes. But if actors played the parts of the other golden ticket-winning children, what happened to the real children? We know that Wonka had a reputation for hurting other people. Is it possible that the children never left the factory, destined to the ill fate of a candy wrapper themselves? According to some fan theorists, Willy Wonka not only knew Charlie would win the factory, he always intended to use the other children as ingredients for his decadent delights. These claims have left many saying, the candy man can't. Consider Charlie Bucket, a poor boy that happened to live just around the corner from the Wonka chocolate factory. The rest of the children lived all around the world. Isn't it convenient that Charlie would get a ticket? Also, how could Wonka expect a child from the United States to move to London and take over a business? Willy Wonka wanted a child near him, one that he could groom, that would move into his factory without hesitation. If this were the case, though, why have the four other tickets? Simple. To murder the children and use them in his candy. Think about when the children and their parents first enter the factory. They are asked to sign waivers, totally absolving Mr. Wonka from any retribution if the children are harmed. Next, the children are taken to a large room fit with edible teacups, lollipops growing from the ground, and a chocolate river. When gluttonous Augustus Gloop begins drinking from the river, Wonka panics. When Augustus falls in, struggling to stay afloat, Wonka is only concerned about the quality of his chocolate. Being sucked into a pipe, the rest of the kids are told that Augustus is being sent to the fudge room, never to be seen again. Fudge room, coded language for another one of Wonka's twisted perversions. Wonka then calls for a boat, a boat with just enough seats for the four children, their single parent guardian, and himself. If he intended for all contestants to survive, he would have needed a bigger boat. Next, they are shown the greatest tasting gum ever invented, though it isn't fit for human consumption. Violet Beauregard, a well-documented gum addict, was chosen seemingly at random. Why would Wonka share this dangerous candy with an at-risk youth? His apathetic attempts to stop her prove he was not legitimately concerned with Violet's safety. It is safe to assume that as she turned blue, she was infused with all of the blueberry favor needed to flavor hundreds of thousands of pieces of gum. The sadistic Oompa Loompas cheerfully rolled her to her grave as they took her to the juicing room. Violet's addiction was destined to blow up sooner or later. After this, the remaining children and their parents are taken to see the golden geese. Baruka, a spoiled brat, obsessed with the glitz and glam, demanded to her father and to Wonka that she didn't care how, but she wanted a golden goose at that moment. Her greed was enough for Wonka's machines to pass judgment upon the poor, unfortunate girl that she was a, quote, bad egg. We can only assume that she was used to fill chocolate eggs, her father included. The tour then proceeds to the Wonka Mobile, a contraption with only five seats, again, enough for two children, their parents, and one for Wonka himself. 
This was, of course, before Mike TV shrunk himself into a perfect bite-sized snack. When considering all of this information, we see a killer who is not only deliberate in his actions, but calculated, shifting the guilt to the children themselves. This entire theory is even more sadistic when you consider that Wonka was only looking for an heir to pin the bodies to. If Charlie was going to inherit the factory and Wonka's wealth, he was also going to inherit Wonka's trail of bodies. Not only was Wonka guilty of stealing intellectual property, subjecting a whole tribe of people to indentured servitude, and murdering many children, he was also guilty of being sexist. He never considered giving the factory over to Violet and Veruca. Willy Wonka only employed male Oompa Loompas. He may have had a glass elevator, but was obviously too afraid to break the glass ceiling. We here at Suck My Fan Theory have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Willy Wonka was a sadistic and evil businessman. A man who built his company on the candy-coated backs of millions. A racist, sexist cannibal by today's standards, and horrible in ways worse than can be conjured through pure imagination. Though the man left many broken in his path, not all hope is lost. A group of Wonka survivors have formed a support community to process this traumatic experience through various artistic mediums, the culmination of which being the forthcoming documentary, Leaving Wonka Land. The following is an excerpt from their most recent public workshop. Oompa, loompa, doompa dee doo I've got a lie that's been hidden from you. Oompa, loompa, doompa dee dee If you are woke, you will listen to me. What do you get when you murder some kids? Stealing ideas when others have dibs. Wonka forced us to do terrible acts. What will you do when you face these facts? He even sexed my girlfriend. Oompa, loompa, doompa dee da. If you don't believe him, you will go far. You will live in happiness too. Unlike the oompa, loompa, doompa dee do. Aubrey, I really miss you. Famed author Angelica Pickles has granted a rare public interview. The year is 2000, the dawn of the new millennium, and only one interviewer has the power to draw such an exclusive guest. Oprah Gail Winfrey. Angelica is promoting her powerful memoir, released earlier that month to rave reviews and widespread praise. Tales of a Rugrat, a book that would become a worldwide phenomenon a phenomenon that would catapult Angelica amongst the great thinkers of her age. The book detailed the early life of Miss Pickles and her seven compatriots, Tommy, Chucky, Phil, Lil, Susie, Kimmy, and Dill. They tumble in and out of trouble, inventing delightful imaginary lands and developing together as a diverse group of young children growing up in a post-Nixon America. Their stories captivated young and old readers alike, reminding us all of what it meant to be young at heart. Miss Pickles intended the interview to be a celebratory announcement of her second memoir, Rugrats, All Grown Up. Instead, it became the quintessential gotcha interview as Oprah scrutinized her every word and brought into question the validity of her memoirs. Here is an excerpt from The Fiery Exchange. Dear guests, today we have a very special guest. Please welcome Angelica Pickles! Everybody, I want you to look under your chair. You have a copy of Angelica's book, but don't open it yet. Because it might be fake. Ooh. So Angelica, literary fraud... How do you respond to accusations that the characters of your book aren't actually real? Ah, yes. Um, I have heard those kooky claims from the fringes of the literary community. The people making those claims have been laughed out of literary circles, and it seems childish for me to even entertain these theories. Excuse the pun. But 
Why have we never heard from Tommy or Chucky or Lil? Why not quash these rumors once and for all with a simple public appearance on the Oprah Winfrey show in front of the entire world? The audience has doubts. You have doubts. And you have doubts. And you have doubts. And everybody has doubts. Obviously, I changed their names. What kind of parent would name their twins Lil and Phil? My friends prefer to keep their personal lives intact, unlike me. (laughs) Sometimes I think they made the smarter choice and I'm the crazy one. It took me long enough to convince them to let me write about our childhood. Getting them into public would be impossible. Oprah would continue to grill Miss Pickles for the next 30 minutes. The answers were not satisfactory. This less than convincing display would have made headlines had Oprah not, later in that episode, gone on to give everyone in the audience a brand new car. While each attendee went home content with a sparkly new 2001 Chrysler Sebring, the suspicious nature of Angelica's answers faded from the public's memory. This psychological phenomenon has come to be known as Oprah Groupthink. Commonly referred to as Harpo Syndrome, it is the act of complete amnesia in the aftermath of reckless philanthropy. A subject will be unable to recall even the most traumatic, life-altering events when that event is immediately followed by receiving free merch. Hear testimony from members of the audience suffering from Harpo Syndrome. Keep in mind, these two poor souls were attending the Oprah Winfrey Show moments after experiencing traumatic events. The first, having just learned he had lost his job and his wife was filing for divorce. The second, had slept in too late to attend the free continental breakfast at her La Quinta Inn and Suites. Oh my god, I could not believe that I went to the Oprah f***ing Winfrey show and she gave me a new f***ing car. I don't care if it breaks down after even like three months of driving it or that I have to pay $10,000 of taxes on it. It was a new f***ing car. Angelica Pickles? Who the is that? Imagine this. One moment, you're just a normal person on the street. The next moment, you're whisked away to a fantasy land and Oprah Winfrey is yelling right in your face. Cut to you, cruising down the highway, wind in your hair, in a new 2001 Chrysler Sebring. The tunes are loud, the sun is shining, the AC is already broken, and you are living. Huh? Didn't she write that baby book? I'm not familiar. Do you think it's on cassette so I can listen in my car? So as the public feasted on the saccharine sweet distraction of a new 2001 Chrysler Sebring, a car J.D. Power & Associates called a vehicle, Angelica Pickles was able to escape with her public image untarnished. But a movement began among a group of skeptics who refused to be easily swayed by mid-sized sedans. Internet journalist Eric Dubé, renowned for his work on the Flat Earth Theorem, an expose of the hoax known as paleontology, decided to set about investigating the authenticity of these questions. Following credible leads gleaned from online message boards, Dubé tracked down the author's childhood home in suburban Los Angeles, California. He began searching the only way he knew how, knocking on doors and shouting down old people in the middle of the day hoping to find someone that knew Angelica when she was a child. Yes? Oh, oh, hello, young man. What can I do? Hey, I'm looking, uh, I'm looking for Angelica. Hmm, Angelica, I I don't think I know any... Angelica Pickles. Angelica, the name doesn't ring a bell. I know she used to live here. Where's Angelica? Angelica, are you talking about that young lady who lived down there? No, you know exactly what I'm talking about, you old Oh, I'm sorry, I quite don't understand. Why are you lying to the American people? You're lying to me. I'm an American. I I didn't think I'm lying to anybody. You came and knocked on the babies. The freaking babies, you old. What what do you say about the claims that the babies were never real? Babies weren't real. What what babies are you talking about? The babies. The freaking babies. The rug rats. The freaking rug rats. I know what I'm talking about. Are you trying to say I don't know what I'm talking about? You you need to calm down. No, don't tell me to calm down. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the babies. She's making it up. She's making all of it up. Nixon was a hero. The American people deserve the truth. Bankers funded the experiments on Scooby-Doo. Willy Wonka ran a sex ring. And you need to tell me where Angelica is. After three days, five neighborhoods, and eight separate charges of aggravated trespassing, all of which were later brought to civil court, Dubé uncovered a bombshell. An eyewitness. A person who was actually there. A person who could corroborate Angelica's claims or condemn her. A one Arlene Pickles. 
widow and third wife to Louis' grandpa Lou Pickles, Angelica's paternal grandfather. In this shocking, ad-riddled, three-hour tell-all interview posted to YouTube, Dubé uncovers many shocking truths, among which are Angelica's reputation as the neighborhood bully, the fact that she changed no names in her memoir, and that most of the children, tragically, never existed at all. Could it be that Angelica was a liar, making things up for her memoirs to manipulate audiences and make millions? Or perhaps something more sinister? What if we said we found a medieval codex, one foretelling the prophecy of a witch duping the world into believing in ghosts? Some believe that this witch is Angelica herself. Others yet say that she wasn't knowingly duping anyone. What if Angelica actually believed everything she wrote in her memoirs, even if none of it was actually true? In her exclusive tell-all interview, Arlene reveals the sad, true story that her step-granddaughter is actually a poor, unfortunate soul. Like many great authors before her, her mind has slipped through the cracks of sanity and ended up in a dazed world based off of half-truths and constructed reality. Some of the claims made in the book are undoubtedly true. Others are the tragic result of a tough childhood. Neglected by her parents and raised in a household marred with grief, Miss Pickles was forced to make up her own friends, all influenced by the melancholic adults her parents associated with. Newspaper clippings from 1985 tell the unfortunate tale of Melinda and Charles Finster, a young mother out for a Sunday drive in the California mountains with her beautiful ginger baby boy, affectionately known as Chucky. The winding roads of the High Sierra are treacherous even in perfect conditions, as they cut in and out of loose rock and skirt perilous cliffs. Adding any hazard to this environment can prove deadly. Every day we leave the comfort of our homes, we play a game of chance with fate. Some win to gamble again tomorrow, others lose, wishing if only they could have had another turn at the table. Melinda Finster woke up that day not knowing that she would lose. The nearby town of San Bernardino was having a festival to commemorate the life and times of Scooby-Doo. The sponsor for this event was Chiquita Bananas. The mascot of the company, a Carmen Miranda impersonator, was running late and decided to take a shortcut. A shortcut that would lead her into a fateful encounter with the Finster family. Hastily speeding down the road in her convertible sports car, she had forgotten to secure her signature headdress. She had lost her head, the hat had lost a banana, and Melinda Finster lost her life. Father and husband Chaz was devastated at the loss of his life partner and young ginger son. In the court proceedings and newspaper interviews, he is described as a nervous wreck. While recovering from the shock, he spent some time in the home of family and friends, the Pickles. How else could a young Angelica handle the unimaginable grief of a man who had lost everything than by creating an imaginary friend? A son for this unconsolable man, equally as frightful. Oh, poor Chaz was an absolute wreck after Melinda passed. If we weren't careful, he would return to that stretch of highway to keep his mind occupied, just staring at the tire marks left on the ground. He never ate a banana again. In 1973, at the height of the tyrannical reign of Richard M. Nixon, the U.S. Supreme Court decided on Roe v. Wade, a landmark ruling that the regulation of abortion by state and federal government was unconstitutional. Not only did this enrage the criminal president, but it also gave women everywhere the right to choose what happens to their bodies. Women like Betty DeVille, a family friend to the Pickles and famous softball player of the time. Arlene Pickles vividly remembers the fights that Betty and her husband Howard would get into at various dinner parties and social functions. Also present at these squabbles, a young Angelica. The constant bickering of the two and growing belly of Miss DeVille allowed for Angelica's imagination to run wild, believing that a baby would soon come out but never seeing the result 
the young girl made up more friends to join her at her fantastical imaginary tea party. Not knowing whether or not the expected baby was a boy or a girl, she created a set of twins. I wasn't around them for long, but I could tell they weren't getting along. Any time they'd start up screaming about why she wasn't taking her birth control, we'd shoo Angelica away, encourage her to play with another one of her uncle's failed contraptions. She probably called the boy Phil because she always heard them hollering about the pill. But to imagine the sister was named Lil because it rhymed. Speaking of her uncle and his failed contraptions, what about Tommy Pickles, Angelica's first cousin and the so-called leader of these rugrats? What about him? Surely she could not live her whole life assuming she was related to someone who does not exist. In fact, that is exactly what she did. Arlene talks fondly of her one-time stepson, Stu, and his dedication to his new family. She describes the joy he felt knowing that he would be a father, taking pride to make all of the toys his son would one day play with. Tragically, she also remembers, with a survivor's clarity, the pain he felt when his son was found to be non-viable. His house became a shrine to the playdates he would never see. Even after he found out, Stu just kept making toys. Mm-hmm. He would disappear into the basement for hours, leaving Dee Dee all alone. At one point, I thought he was going to pull out each one of those precious purple hairs of his. He couldn't bear to have any other children play with them. There you have it. Of the Rugrats, Chucky had died in a car accident, the twins had been aborted, and her own cousin, Tommy Pickles, was painfully taken by the cold, Nixon-like hands of the Grim Reaper before he was ever born. The prophecy from the medieval codex came true, but only partially. A woman made millions believe in ghosts that she herself truly believed in. But what does it matter if she made them up? The stories she tells are just as real as the audiences make them. The skepticisms and questions would have to be confined to the subscribers of Eric Dubé's YouTube channel. A group that numbers in the dozens. We here at Suck My Fan Theory have also found that Arlene is in no way related to Angelica Pickles. Her name actually being Arlene Klasky, Eric Dubé's geriatric romantic partner. So, who really knows what the truth is, but quite frankly, who really cares? This all makes for great television. At the end of his interview, Eric Dubé synthesized his findings of his investigation thusly. So that's it, folks. They're turning the frickin' frogs gay, and there's nothing you can do about it. Don't forget to smoke grass, eat a and that the babies were fake the whole time. All grown up, more like all made up. Fans around the world report inconsistencies in their favorite stories. Are they real? Or just a result of having way too much time on your hands. Thank you for joining us in our investigations on Suck My Fan Theory. Hello? This is Alex and Ryan in real life. We hope you have enjoyed listening to our Suck My Fan Theory investigations. I would like to give a quick shout out to History Channel and to Monster Quest for filling my childhood with nonsense, but giving me the inspiration to come up with a stupid idea like this. Now, we would like to do something a little crazy that we've never done before. Ryan, uh, do you want to tell them about it? Yeah. Uh, so typically, we have one-sided conversations with the listeners and authors out there, but today, we have invited a special guest. Angelica Pickles' world was rocked when our investigation dropped publicly, and she contacted us, wanting to give us her side of the story. We understand we are usually very one-sided in our investigations, and in hindsight, we may have given Eric Dubé's theories a little too much consideration, so... In the spirit of fairness, without further ado, we'd like to welcome Angelica Pickles to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. 
I just want to say that Eric Dubé is an absolute nut job. Anyone wasting their time on stupid conspiracies, especially fan theories, like why would you spend your time on something so dumb? And quite frankly, you have done absolutely no research and have done a terrible okay, job. Okay, thank you for that, Angelica. Thank you. Ryan will see you out. Thank you. Suck is in the name! Oh, okay, well that's just... That was unnecessary. Uh, well, to conclude... Uh, this has been a culmination of about two months of work between the planning, writing, recording, collaborating, and editing. And we just wanted to take the time to express our appreciation that you would give us your time and listen to us. We also wanted to thank all of our collaborators, who include All Tip Podcast, Anxenity Podcast, Colby Mack, Bailey and Vanessa from Booze and Spirits, Shannon from Snap Food Podcast, and Liz and Matt from Definitely Inappropriate, and also our patrons who also helped collaborate, which include Audra, Jason, Matt from Drinkopedia, a podcast about something, Henry from Firestarters, and Brad, Katie, Alyssa, and Anna. If you listen to this podcast and enjoyed it or were entertained in any form, please consider that it is entirely free to listen to. All that we ask for is your ears. But if you feel compelled to give more, um, subscribing to us on your podcast platform of choice, um, leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to us is extremely helpful. We also advertise by social media and word of mouth. So if you enjoyed this episode and enjoy our podcast, please consider telling your friends about us. And if you really like this, like really like this, like want a lock of our hair in the mail like this. Um, That's a high level tier on, high on Patreon because we have one, a Patreon. So you consider becoming a patron. It ain't much, but it's honest work. We would sincerely appreciate anyone who would consider becoming one of our patrons. We do our best to put exclusive content on there and you can get your episodes early. Well, with that... Please don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and don't forget that we have a YouTube channel. All of it is under Suck My Fanfic. Thanks again, and Ryan, what should we remember? What is a fan theory? Some say it's an insane concoction of projecting oneself into an innocent work of fiction. Yet others believe it is an expose of the author's true intention. In a world where we can't trust our authors, candy makers, and celebrity dogs... Just know that it doesn't matter at the end of the day. We have our friends and our loved ones. We have each other. Have a nice day, everyone.